This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Created by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Bloomberg Connects is the free app that lets you access museums, galleries and cultural spaces around the world on demand. Download Bloomberg Connects to access digital guides and explore a variety of content. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and welcome to A Brush With, the podcast where I talk to artists about their cultural experiences and influences, the artists that inspire their early lives and their current practice, the writers and poets who inform their work, the music they listen to in the studio and the cultural epiphanies that have marked their lives. And for this episode, it's A Brush With, Christina Iglesias. Christina's a sculptor and maker of installations, but much of her work comes close to architecture. Her work responds to real world spaces and natural forms, but she creates with them poetic and imaginative realms. Christina was born in 1956 in San Sebastian in the Basque region of northern Spain and emerged in the 1980s as one of a diverse group of European artists who in different ways sought to inject new energy into sculpture. Among the others was Juan Muñoz, Christina's late husband, himself a great sculptor and installation artist who died in 2001. From the start, Christina's work had a distinct feel for both material and space. Early works combined concrete, glass, iron and baroque tapestries with some elements on the wall and others projecting into the viewer's space. It set the tone for a lifelong fascination with both rich materials and textures and the creation of dense, immersive environments. Pavilions made from hanging screens with text written into their structure and related lattice panels which she calls celosias which evoke both Islamic screens and Catholic confessionals. Passageways and mazes constructed using vegetal forms, branches and leaves, sometimes built into the walls of galleries and at other times freestanding within stainless steel structures that melt into their environments. They're spaces that create distinctive experiences, imaginative and fictional, yet relating to real world phenomena like forests or geological formations. They're utterly transportative. Increasingly, Christina's made public architectural works, often on a huge scale and frequently involving water. There's Deep Fountain outside the Museum of Fine Arts in Antwerp, where she created a vast tidal pool which operates on an hour-long cycle, slowly filling with water to reflect the museum's grand neoclassical portico and then emptying to reveal a bed of densely woven casts of leaves. There's Tres Aguas, a three-part commission, again involving the flow of water in the central Spanish city of Toledo. There's Estancia Sumergidas, Solosi structures in reinforced concrete in the ocean of Baja California in Mexico. There are her dark and heavy doors for the Prado Museum, Forgotten Streams, her major water-based sculptures outside the Bloomberg HQ in London, which evoke the rivers that run beneath the city of London. And now there's her new work, Ondalea, or Marine Abyss, completed this year in the lighthouse on Santa Clara Island in the bay of her hometown, San Sebastian, which can only be reached by boat. I began our conversation by asking her about Ondalea and what it means to create a major public work so close to where she grew up. It's a work that is connected to other works and and concepts that I've been dealing with. But um, in this case, actually, well, it is, as you said, my hometown, which that's, I mean, I was at the beginning, I was a bit nervous about doing anything there. But then, actually, uh, there was like the perfect situation. uh, Also, it's a place that I've been looking from a distance uh, since I was a child. Then also uh, fishing with my brothers and looking at it because we were living uh, very close to the port when we were children. And, uh, And it has, the context is perfect somehow for what I wanted because it's, it's, um, it's an island. It's an island that it represents like the remote, the distance, but it is in the city, in the middle of the city. It's part of the postal, you know, of the, of the, of the city, the image that everybody gets. Uh, people have been there sometimes when they were children, but, but also a lot of Donostiarras, people from San Sebastian have never been there. Uh, I was looking for a place for which also to travel to it could be part of the piece and uh, and to prepare yourself to, to go there. Actually, at that moment, all the lighthouses in Spain were abandoned. They are not of use anymore. Well, it lights every night, but there is not a light man taking care of it because it's not needed. It's a small lighthouse. 
And so that is automatic uh, since many years, since the 60s. So I thought, what well, is the perfect storm for me? So I proposed to, to do this piece, which first thing I had to, to empty the whole house inside. And, and of course, with structural engineers to hold it in place, I mean, to create stronger devices so that from the outside, actually, you don't see anything. You, you see the house as always was. So you have to travel there to walk up to the lighthouse keeper's house. And then nobody has entered it's, it's since the 60s it was abandoned, but also even when they were living there, of course, it's not a place nobody can enter. So it was a surprise also to, you know, an, an opportunity to use a space that people have dreamed about or have thought about because it's also very mysterious, it's full of literature around it. And so they allowed me to excavate nine meters inside down towards the sea, which is quite extraordinary and and you've made this video which accompanies the piece which is really evocative because one of the things that's really striking about it is that yes it's contained within that lighthouse keeper's space it's it's in that building and yet somehow you seem to have brought the elements in there when the water pours into that bronze structure yes. you have this amazingly elemental sound don't you it's really one has to go there that's a bit frustrated that the fact that well or not is part of the idea that uh, there is no photo or even video that gets close to it because really the it is a piece that being in it really changes everything because the sound, as you said, the lighting inside. And then so I did, uh, I constructed like a cave uh, that goes down. I mean, you enter into the void of this huge cave. The thing is that the piece looks inside much bigger than the outside, you know, which is in the line of the Baroque that I always loved. And uh, it is made in bronze. And actually, uh, from wall to wall, I mean, there is a sequence of, of water movement. Also, sometimes it's in calm. And suddenly, it's like a tempest inside. Like if the water crashes inside from different points and... And actually, you see five meters down, but it has the illusion of being much deeper. Of course, it reminds you, you, have your, you go with your memories of, uh, of art, but also your memories of the coasts that I wanted to refer to, because the coasts there are spectacular, and, and, and the, you, one can see how time has passed, and you see the the formation of the planet, you, you really, the, what is called the flish that goes along the coast from Thumaya to, to Heithkivel. So we did actually uh, record, I mean, we did 3D uh, surfaces. I mean, we took those textures, but just as a texture, then I had to, to modulate them in forms. So it's a total fiction, but of course, it touches the memory you have of nature and reality. And at the same time, you get loaded by, by this fiction that when you return, you go down or you just get lost a bit in the island and take the boat again, you come back and you look at the, at the house and you remember what you saw. It's, it's got so much in common with so many of the most powerful pieces that you've done because it seems to me that... I know that you began studying chemistry before you turned to art, right? Yes. And so you always have had a kind of scientific basis for lots of what you do, but your work is totally about the imagination. So there's this interesting push and pull between empirical information and knowledge and then the realms of the imagination. Tell me something about that. Actually, it's true. I mean, I did study chemical science for three years, but I have to say that physics and and uh, geology were my favorite issues in the and so it's something that has always been there and one could see also by earlier pieces you know that there is that uh, this idea of how the formation of uh, our planet I mean the formation of also of the rocks and uh, and also what you said this relation between the natural and the fictional has been very much in my work also as a as a way to to explore to explore like in a laboratorium you know like pieces i have done even the one in baja california i mean it is a lab actually because they we we compromised ourselves 
to record everything that is happening during these years, you know, to to have a recall of, of how life can be regenerated. And, so. and, and tell me a bit about the idea of journey and your work, because in, in terms of the spaces that you create and the public sculptures, there's always an element of time in them, in the sense that you, you uh, with the Celosias, you, you walk into spaces, you're surrounded by these spaces, they take time to read, you take time to, to find your way around them. And then, of course, in, in, in terms of the public sculptures involving water, they literally change over time. Water is flowing in and out of them. So time is really crucial to you, isn't it? Yeah, very much, very much so. As you said, or even in the references to architecture, or to the creation, as you said, of passages, uh, that are formed by text, etc., hanging or not hanging to that idea that the text also forms like a narrative that the spectator, I mean, the walker, the passerby can also cross or, you know, like in the doors of the Prado too, that is something that moves and six times a day. So it, it forms different spaces. So it becomes public even if you don't cross to enter the temple of the imaginary between the city it is what it is, a passage. And actually all that talks about time, I mean, because it changes during the day. And the introduction of water, uh, when I started with it, I was aware that water, of course, I create a sequence. Water uh, changes the how, how it appears, disappears, appears again, runs faster or, or slower. So these, uh, especially when it's also in the public realm, it, it works also with the flow of the city. It cuts it somehow and, and organizes in a different way so people can uh, look at it and take time to see the different levels of water and what, what it reveals and reveals. But also I think is a timer that you go and it also changes you know, the, what is happening. So maybe you go at another time, another day, and the piece is different. I'm not the first sculpture that does a, works with water or works with time. Actually, with time is like, like in cinema and, and so many other expressions. Time is, is crucial. Is a, is a, is a, I mean, and, and artists, we confront that in different ways, but it's true that I have used it as an actual material you know, that is present. I'm going to start asking the questions that we ask all our artists now. So, who was the first artist whose work you loved? As a little child, (laughs) it was uh, maybe Fantasia from Walt Disney with Stravinsky music, you know, because because actually I always loved music and... um, but maybe in books first, Las Hilanderas, you know, the, of uh, Velázquez, because you know the fable of Aragna and actually the, the relation between the goddess, I mean, the, the, the myths and the crafts. I was so, so impressed by it. And of course, some years later, because I'm from San Sebastian, I went with my parents to, to Madrid and they took us to the Prado, uh, my, to me and my, my siblings, and I was astonished, but uh, actually Aragne, uh, that also uh, takes from Titian's The Composition of the Rape of Europe, and all that, I mean, has been one of my favorite artists. But also, a bit later, I have to say, and maybe very influential in in, uh, concepts of my work, has been uh, Giotto, for example, the Scroveni Chapel uh, in Padua, because the storytelling inside the architecture, the repetition of the faces, the use of that painting in architecture with the blue sky. I was really taken by the power of all of it being a single piece, a complete installation. And that was maybe the first lesson in the possibilities of sculpture related also to painting and the illusionism of painting. That's really interesting because that's absolutely in your work, isn't it? Because there are certain people who create sculptural environments in which the surface doesn't necessarily have a particular import. But your mm-hmm. work is it's two dimensionally interesting at the same time as being an environment in itself. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah, I think that's that's very important in my work. And I've been inspired a lot by painting, knowing always that I wanted to do sculpture because precisely for that capacity of illusionism that painting has. 
I'm so pleased that you mentioned this. We call it the Spinners, the Arachne painting by Velasquez. But it, because Las Meninas is such a famous picture and everybody heads to Las Meninas, but that they don't, the Spinners is such an amazing painting and it, it, it barely gets any attention. Yeah, you know? it's, it's true. And, you know, it's, it's not because of that, I promise you, but all the personages are women in that painting. <laughs> but actually, it is also the relation and after, you know how much I like tapestries as a, as a relation or, or let's say, a f- fable of, the, of nature. You know? And how much in stories that can be in it and, and the reflection of it, which, of course, you find in Las Meninas, the idea of the mirror. But there, in a different way, also, also appears and is very complex. You mentioned the Baroque earlier on, and obviously Velázquez mm-hmm. is a key painter mm-hmm. of the Baroque period, but and also those tapestries that you directly involved in your work, mm-hmm. you know, so you'd have that, those amazing constructions, and then and then sort of in a way which which completely threw me the first time I saw your work. There there was this actual tapestry, and it seemed such a sort of novel idea to actually sort of take that Baroque yeah, element and just yeah. actually make it a singular part of the work. Yes, as a ready-made, but at the same time, the reflection of the, in the, in the glass or in other times, in the, in the stainless steel completes an image, but in a very non-defined way, no? that I like, very, I mean, I'm very interested in, in that. Yeah, but this idea of the artifice is very much in the Baroque. Who's the historical artist that you turn to the most now? Related to what we were saying, I mean, being always interested in the Baroque because also I was living uh, for a year in Rome. And uh, so I I would say that Bernini and Borromini has been because of the capacity also of illusion, apart from the history of the conquest between the two. But uh, uh, Borromini, uh, San Carlino, La Quattro Fontana has been... Also, again, I mean, again, I'm talking about architecture, but also if you think in a sculptural uh, a way of looking to it, and not, I'm not referring to the, the sculptures that appear, that there are also a lot of other artists that work uh, there, but also San Ivo de la Sapienza interests me very much because actually, and related to Ondalea, the last piece I've done, I mean, it has this uh, capacity of making the space look bigger inside than what it is really from outside. And this is something that I, I, I found magic, you know, and I, and I think sculpture also, because that sort of things affect your, the way you perceive it and you, how you put yourself towards, towards the piece and how, you, how it affects your, your emotion, etc. So that would be also, I would tell you, the the Laurenziana Library of Michelangelo, the staircase I love in the same terms that I'm I'm saying Leonardo da Vinci for this capacity of variety of interests. I mean, even even if there is not a specific uh, piece that I will tell you that interests me, but this the attitude, no, of being so open, so free, or 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 or, or maybe he probably b- believed that he was so incredibly gifted and powerful you know, that could do everything <laughs> <laughs> like being an engineer and sculptor and architect and painter today of course that has changed because because in this Leonardian way of thinking is more collaborative you no know, and which I like very much and I, I I want to have ideas that I know that other people that are experts in fields I can include you know like uh, like the engineering part, the mechanical part that sometimes I, I use and I'm still very, very interested because uh, as we were saying before, includes movement, includes a lot of things that otherwise wouldn't be possible. And uh, of course, when I did The Doors at the Prado, of course, The Doors of Ghiberti, The Paradise, you know, in, in Florence, the Rodin gates of hell, and also from Rodin's the, the bourgeois. You know, I mean, I, there are so many references that I go, and then uh, more in other times, I would say Eva Hesse for me was a. I remember when I was in London, Lucy Lippard's book on Eva Hesse was a revelation because I didn't know about her. You know, mm. coming from San Sebastian, and uh, and then of course, as you can see also in my work. And I go back and I, and I look, I've tried to, to go in and visit the pieces, all the, like Smithson and Nancy Holt, Michael Heiser, Walter de Maria, the land art artists were a great discovery for me. 
and maybe also got Gordon Mata Clark, you know, with the houses and and uh, yeah. slicing them and, and make creating an incredible new construction. It's interesting because I spoke very recently to Michael Rakowitz on the on the very most recent um, a brush with he yes. too talked about Mata Clark and one of the themes that I've seen developing as the more the more that we do this podcast is how much figures like Mata Clark, like Smithson, like Eva, Eva Hesse are. are are almost contemporary artists, even though we've lost them, they are still so present in the thinking of so many artists today that it's as if their work still lives in a very vivid way. Absolutely. I mean, for me, I think they, they are so present and, and their discourse is so contemporary. And uh, as I was telling also before in my work, uh, the idea of the remote and, and the fact that you have to move and have to take the decision and, 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 and need a journey to go there. You know? Or even the, the fact of walking that we were talking before, also in terms of time, to walking in a piece, to walk from one side to another sometimes. You know, like what I did in, with three hours, that there are three sides and you have to to walk from one to the other and you have the memory, the recollection of one into the other. So, but they have been incredible examples, very formative, but as you said, still they are, I think, there, here. <laughs> and which, which other contemporary artists do you most admire? Oof, that, that's difficult because I would say so much. It's always so hard. <laughs> so many, but uh, of course, and there are pieces, you know, that I, I, I love more than others. But I would say it, as a whole, I always have admired and still look at when he does one new piece to Bruce Nauman because for the wide, wide range of his discourse, from his corridors to, to his videos, from those videos of the studio at night, it has for his attitude as an artist and as a human being that I find so vivid, so so curious, so much in the world. It's, I, I mean, a man that has a long career behind, but he's still so young. So it's, uh, and has been formative to so many artists. I would also mention uh, somebody that is also a friend, Ronnie Horn, for the poetry of her work and also her drawings that, I don't know, contain a sort of geological construction of, of words that I, I, I love and I'm always intrigued. And, and uh, Pierre Wick, uh, that I find him also, again, intriguing because, I mean, with your contemporaries, I don't like so much when I understand everything, but I find that um, he sometimes uses certain theatrical devices that I feel close to somehow, Tacita Dean that has this very special sensibility and also I have the luck to be friends and uh, one artist that I like and also intrigues me a lot because I don't understand much <laughs> but is Matthew Barney that I like yeah. uh, you know the way he relates uh, cinema and sculpture and I admire very much that he has invented his own world and this is something that uh, well I don't know I could tell you so many <laughs> but, it, but it is actually really interesting because like you said I mean the, the, those artists all have very different languages I like that you, you said that thing about some of the work being sort of ungraspable that still you you, mm -hmm. you have to keep looking and keep looking and testing Absolutely. yourself in the, through the process of experiencing their work mm -hmm. And there are, there are pieces sometimes that tricks you and triggers something inside you, you know, and that you say, well, I wish I could have done that piece. <laughs> Now, now, I know you in your studio, I've had the good fortune to visit you in your studio in Torlodones, and yes. and you have a kind of two studio structure, don't you? You have a kind of mm -hmm. a, effectively a kind of um, a, a factory, which, which produces yes. the larger works. And then you have this very intimate space where you work, where you do your drawings and bas reliefs and things. Yeah. Do you have things around you? Do you have things pinned up around you in that space? So, so works by other artists? Yes. Well, not so much works by other artists. I actually, honestly, what I have more is... It's lots of images of my own work, the projects I'm involved, you know, that I pin and, and, and I change them actually while, of course, the, the, those walls change. To, there, there are some that stay, there are some labyrinths from the Renaissance that are there as, a, as an image that, that you care and, and of course, all the, some other things. But mainly, mainly in that board that I think you are referring to would be also 
I have uh, architectural references like stairs, alleys that I'm interested, you know, and I, I always, uh, you have an image that, that somehow is a spiral that you have in your head, you know. And uh, also, all these years, I, I'm full of studies of geological sites, rock formations, botany studies, and also the sea. And um, and uh, and that, that surrounds me. It's a way of surrounding you, but also... My table, I have a huge black table, uh, which is full of drawings, architectural plans of projects and sections of images, uh, all of projects that I'm working with, some of them to an extent, other are, others are more advanced, others I have just to get an, a new idea, you know, and you have part of it, so it's huge, and I have several tables, and I go around and sit, and that, that would be also an idea of, of the wall you are, you are saying. And uh, that's in my intimate uh, studio that now takes the whole house. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, It becomes less intimate over yes, time. <laughs> yes, somehow, but I always have a, a little place that I feel intimate. One place that has become like a very important way of working has been the foundry, because I develop a way of working uh, in the foundry that is not to do something and ask to do a mold of it, you know, or to produce without your you being involved. I'm super involved because uh, I, I do many times develop motifs that I sometimes repeat other times. I mean, they, are, they have marks, they have imprints, and then it's a compositional way of working. So... There is a small foundry that has become like a, an extension of my studio and I go continuously there and I have, I work waxes and I have drawings and things on the walls. <laughs> right. I mean, because one of the things that we should say is that the pattern of your work, that very, very particular texture that your works have is really crucial, isn't it? You work, you work really hard at getting that particular feel on the top of the surface. Yeah, you are so right. But it, because it's about color, but it's about also the feeling that can give you, if something you want it to darker, I mean, because it's a, it's a pot or it's a well, you look down and I want sometimes it to go into dark. And, and you know, I'm also very interested in the pattern of time. I mean, to allow, depending on the, on the situation and the context, to allow, I'm working now actually in a project that we want the organisms and the nature. And, and I've worked also before a lot with manglars and, uh, and the relation with with water, and that creates a different patina. So patina has been always, uh, and there, as you said before, maybe it's my chemist side, but no, I think it's, it's also about color and about life. This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. The app offers access to numerous culture institutions through a single download. Among the landmark shows in Christina Iglesias' career to date were two touring retrospectives, the first of which was organised by the Guggenheim in New York, while the second came to the Whitechapel Gallery in London. Digital guides to both the Guggenheim and the Whitechapel are available on Bloomberg Connects, where you can keep up to date with the latest shows and projects at both institutions. There are resources to help you make the most of visiting the galleries, as well as content you can enjoy on demand, wherever you are, including audio and behind-the-scenes videos. For more content and to explore guides to all the partnering institutions download Bloomberg Connects today. You can find the app at bloombergconnects.org and it's also available to download from the App Store and Google Play. If you could travel back in time to meet any artist, who would it be? I, I would go back more to a moment in history where artists share a thinking, no, like a, like the constructivism. I mean, that, that moment where the modern industrial society and the urban space, you know, they were, were they, I mean, artists were working with those issues. And uh, well, then I would mention Tatlin and his counter reliefs, but also Katarina Kobro, Rodchenko, uh, Stefano Alboholi Nagin in photography that I've used a lot also. On another level, Diagalev and the Russian ballets, you know, I, I will tell you so many things and the Bauhaus too. Again, going to the as, as a step after, no, this crossing of design, architecture, and art, the abstract geometry, so influential also today, and yeah, Walter Gropius, but but the idea of school 
uh, but a school of collaboration, not only of of uh, education, but it also, of course, but this this real collaboration between artists. Yeah, I love that because there are those great moments where they're forging a new identity for the world. You know, yes. they're right on the cusp of something entirely new, right? So it would be extraordinary to witness that. I mean, of course, um, the life of an artist and the life of those people is it, it, it's so much concerned with actually quite a lot of humdrum activity, like not non, uh, non-glamorous activity, but still it's just such a fascinating thing, the idea of actually yes. entering into those spaces and seeing them on, on the cusp of something yes. amazing. Yeah. I'm sure they also felt the isolation we feel, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> they had that side. Yeah, you are right, so which cultural experience changed the way you see the world? In 2007, I think it was, I did my first trip to Baja California to start working on a sculpture to be done there. And, and so I became involved in, in this program of, with the marine biologists as an experience. First, that with these people, these scientists that were doing a real work of creation of, of marine refuges and to be part of it as an artist to say, okay, maybe we can bring light to something. They are the real activists, but I can be there. And to also when they, I hear them that telling me that the, the sea could recuperate itself if we take care. So, but also to dive, because that brought diving to my life. And, and I had to, when we were working, I had to dive three times a day. It was hard work, I tell you. And, <laughs> and, uh, and if you are not used, it really affects your senses. And, and you, you know, the first time you lose the sense of balance and what is above, what is below you. And sometimes uh, we had to go when, when there, there is a lot of plankton in, in the Mar of Cortez. So it's, it seemed to be foggy, you know, taking over a city because actually the piece is quite architectural. And so slowing things discover themselves to you. Yes, as I said, one of these chef scientists explained to me that there were things in danger, extreme danger of disappearing and the catastrophic effects that would have. But then they say, explain how if we leave the ocean alone, and that was a program that was towards that, it would have the capacity of regenerating itself. And this idea uh, of that vast, uh, you know, mass of water, uh, having life growing widely below, even though we can see it, that stayed with me. I was going to ask you what it was like creating a work which would not be seen by very many humans in the sense that you you, you made a work for, for, for marine species effectively. Yes. And it's, I mean, yes, that you can dive down to it, as you say, but actually it's not meant to be experienced by humans. Right? Yeah, yeah. In one hand, no, I mean, one could. I mean, some people can. But uh, like many pieces, like we were saying before, referring to the spiral jetty, I mean, it's, it's an act of belief. I mean, also, and of course, then... Film, photography play a big role. Also, uh, the the people that write and talk about it, and yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's very important. And then uh, it makes you dream of a place, and then maybe you can go. And even there, well, it's seventeen meters down. To be in it, you need to dive with oxygen, oxygen, but also you can see it from above in the best months of the year. That is October and November. But I love this idea that. If you know that there, you know, somewhere there that exists, maybe you see it in your in your mind. So I, I, I like this this point. Uh, and then as I told you before, it is a lab actually. So we are filming at least every two years, you know, so that that we keep record of how life is growing. How fascinating. Um which museum or gallery do you visit most frequently? Well, living in Madrid, the Prado and the Reina Sofia are the two that I visit the most. But uh, I have to say that because yeah, well, the Prado is the one of the best pinacotechs in the in the world. But uh, we don't have a um, an encyclopedic museum like like the Met uh, that I love. And every time I go to New York, I visit and I, I love to get lost and and find things that I was not prepared to not not going to see a specific exhibition, but just to go around. It happened to me in very my formative years, but also I always go and go uh, when I go to London. That I it's one of my favorite places. Uh, I go to to the British Museum where 
our life all these days. I've learned a lot of ancient, you know, of archaeological sites. And, and I would say that also uh, it came a bit later, but I was astonished when I saw the Roman market gates of Miletus or the Ishtar gates of Babylon at the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. I was, you know, to see the gates of a city inside a room, you know, that was that was a shock. And I know there are problems with those things that are uh, uh, kept in these museums, but they are so well kept and I, and for my imagination has been crucial, I would say. That's interesting, isn't it? Because it's, it's not just the work, it's about the work and the space, which of course is what your work's about. Of course, yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, of course, I, you just said a museum. I also have seen things in the open, I mean, like if you go to Petra, but uh, those museums have been, and also again, what I said, again happened to me at the British many, many times that, uh, also at the National Gallery, but but this idea of getting lost and saying, let's see what my eye catches, you know, and st- yeah. where I stopped, you know, to, to look more carefully to a detail. Um, I mean, you mentioned the Prado doors that you made. They're particular doors, aren't they? Because, they're, as you say, you're, they're not the main doors that you go through to enter the museum. But still, when you're designing something which which is a kind of threshold from public space into this realm of the imagination and the realm of the arts, was it was it a difficult commission in some ways for you to complete? Because it is such a significant building for you. Absolutely. You know, I, it was difficult because first thing when they asked me, uh, the architect Moneo and the director of the museum, Miguel Fugaz, at the time, my first reaction was, no, I don't design at do- doors, you know. It was like, <laughs> a bit, we want you to design the doors of the museum, which is incredible because one is Goya, door de Velázquez, the door, so it was amazing. But I say, I cannot, uh, I don't know. And then, of course, immediately I start thinking, as I said before, about that I was constructing passages, corridors, you know. So I started asking the the architect, could I use the space you thought for the doors when they are while open to rest on the facade? Could I use the threshold? So I started having six moving elements. And, uh, and because, as we said, you said, you just mentioned that it's a ceremonial door, uh, I could ask to remove a glass uh, thing they, they were going to put immediately after, and it became a space in itself. And, and therefore, because it has to open every day, because it's a question of security, because if something happens, they they open totally, and the system, it moves at certain hours, and so they are all, always semi-open or semi-closed. <laughs> and, uh, and they create different spaces, so... Uh, it became a public sculpture, not only the doors of the museum. That is already fantastic, the doors of the Prado. But... Let's turn to literature. Which writers or poets do you return to? My poetry has been always quite important in my thinking and, and, and let's say like uh, to go back and back again to the same. So Clarice Lispector, for example, the Brazilian, or was born Ukrainian, but uh, the Brazilian um, poet has been a, a reference to me when I when I start reading it. Well, before was Rilke that also I still love, but uh, the ambiguity and openness that has, uh, for example, Clarice Lispector, all, all the poets actually, but and, and always dealing with complex uh, emotional and uh, and mental processes. Every time the interpretation is is different. Pessoa, el libro del desasosiego that I don't remember how it's translated in in English. Desasosiego is a very nice word that is like the opposite of feeling comfortable. So this book that has, I mean, he was writing with the different personas. It's like different people are himself, you know? And so the angles of talking, and it has poetry in it, it has uh, philosophy. I mean, it's, it's, a, a very, it's also Portuguese. Borges has been also always a reference. And then 
as you know, I also like science fiction, and there I have also a lot of uh, authors that I have included in, in my in some of my pieces, like J.G. Ballard, that I love the drum world, that is well, quite post-apocalyptic, or the crystal world too, that I use both in, in, in different pieces, of course, creating corridors, and there is always a narrative with beginning and end, so it's... it's yeah, now, nowadays, when you think of it, when what we have the pandemic, I mean, it's actually it's something that one can go back to, and uh, because it's yeah, like London overflowed, no, with water, with and and uh, all the all the buildings appearing. Emily Dickinson has been also a very important poet and referent that I would go back and read it in different ways because also I always. I read it in English and it's quite difficult. So <laughs> this is another thing. When you read things in not your mother language, with Portuguese is so close to me that it's, uh, it's different. But in Emily Dickinson, I have another difficulty because it's so dense sometimes. The words yeah. mean so much. And uh, But I, I think I think that's even, I mean, going back to what we were talking about before, the sort of ungraspable quality. I'm yeah. Because so many of you, so many of you artists are, are talking to me about Dickinson, I've, I've you know, really invested in reading her. <laughs> but part of its attraction is how ungraspable it is, how you can read a poem several times and and each time you'll take something else from it you'll wonder about emphases you'll wonder about the sort of voice you it and that that odd punctuation and everything and it is it it, it keeps you coming back and back to it it's it, it it's back utterly back, renewed yeah. every time you read it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. with ballard it's almost like he predicts futures strangely because he's talking it's science <laughs> fiction but there is you know drowned world is obviously so as you say it's so pertinent absolutely and i wonder what it was particularly about the kind of science fiction that attracts you as it, you know, because it's, it seems to me that lots of the references are rooted in a kind of reality that, that is plausible, that there are some forms of science fiction which are more outlandish than others, but you all seem to be the, one, you, you, the ones that you seem to work with are those that somehow connect very pertinently to our present as well as, as, well as expanding out into imagined futures. Yeah, that's interesting what you say, because I, I mean, I always had an approach of the fantastic, you know, like uh, that they describe, like even when I when I refer, when I use text like from Raymond Roussel, the invention d'Afrique is, is a, is a, and, and, and knowing that he never went there, you know, that I, I, admiration for the imagination of, of course, this, the science fiction, normally they are scientists, and part of what they say is true. I mean, it's, it's real. It's, uh, uh, but of course, they, they go into the future and they imagine. And, and I mean, sometimes tragically, we, we arrive very close to what they predict as a fant- as a something impossible, but, you know, but it's connected to reality. In terms of the text which are on the celosias and in the passages... Yes. You can't read them, but they are often based on actual texts, aren't they? Because, for instance, in the Estancias um, Surmejidas, there's a text, is it right, there's a text by Acosta, with yeah, the, the yes. very, very, um, the sort of Renaissance period text about, about the new world, effectively. Yes, this is called Historia Natural y Moral of the Indies, like the new Indies, the natural and moral history of the Indies. And actually, this priest, there was a priest, um, of course, talks about facts, things that they they found, you know, and uh, it has some chapters that talks about the chocolate and all the all the things they found the, in 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 the New Indies that were the Americas. And other times, it's it's more uh, philosophical and poetical. I mean, talking it cannot be true that there is so much light, you know, <laughs> and things like that, uh, because a person would burn if it's true. Because I've done only two pieces with that, with that book, and one is is a big uh, piece that is uh, not underwater, and that is is, is uh, I did it for the Santa Fe Biennial uh, years ago, and um, now actually I'm going to show it in Germany in a show that I have in September. But this this is uh, uh, is made in, in in terracotta, you know, fired at very high temperature, and 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 that talks as I was saying now more. In, in this uh, weird uh, um, way of giving uh, uh, facts and ideas that were more poetic. The, the one at Estancia Sumergidas talks about the Atlantida and as a sp- in the space in between the Europe and the Americas. And, 
and that it was it could have been a whole city going from I mean all the way there you know so is uh, I thought it was very pertinent for that piece I was I was doing there that I knew that one of my best collaborators was nature that, that, that will take over the text and the text is disappearing. There is a morena that is living in an A, but I mean, uh, yes, there is a lot of vegetation now. That's uh, the idea of that, that uh, yeah, that the text existed and that, as I said before, it has beginning and end. I mean, it's, it, it is a narrative in it. It's important for me, though, as you said, not many people or maybe nobody could ever, only in the books you can read it. But Let's talk about music or indeed other audio. What music or other audio do you listen to while you're working? Well, I, I mentioned that when I was a little, I love Stravinsky. And actually, Stravinsky, is, is I, I love it. But also because, you know, it happens that my brother is a composer. Very distinguished composer, right? <laughs> yeah, and, Alberto Iglesias. He's yes. a very, he's a good, yeah. And you know, we are working together. We are uh, working on a piece together, but also always has been somebody that opened my mind to, to, to many composers, like at a time, Gibaldulina, the, the, the Russian uh, contemporary uh, composer. Uh, and so I listen a lot to the music of Alberto because sometimes because he's working in new music and he gives it to me, blah, blah. but also because, as I said, we are working and going around an idea of doing an opera together. My son also, Diego, prepares lists for me on, on Spotify with many things that sometimes I don't know what it is. And other times I say, oh my God, he's also listening to this this musician or, or pieces that, that I used to, I, I've been always listening to. Of course, it comes and goes. It's not like, I mean, sometimes I, I listen to Bach because I need, but, but I, I love to listen also to Björk. The music is, is amazing. Yeah. And also so powerfully, we talked about elemental before. Her music is so elemental. That voice is pure elemental it's pure power, isn't it? Element. I mean, it's like the elements of nature and how she plays with it and then can go from jazz to techno. I don't know. It's, it's really... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How wonderful. Um, I wanted to ask you a bit about, because you, there was a work I know, and you may have titled other works, but I know that there's certainly a group of um, your works on copper, I think, which is mm-hmm. called Fugue in Six Voices, Fuga in, in, in Seis Voices. Oh, so, yes. So, and I wondered about musical titles and, and, and what yes. that suggested about why you chose that. Was it because of a particular connection with, with, with a particular piece of music or was it the sort of structure of the work that suggested to you a musical form? Precisely. It was more the structure of the work, like the contrapunto, like saying, well, uh, there are 12 uh, pieces, so six and six. And I, I thought on that as a, as a good title for, for that piece that actually I did it as a, as a corridor and, uh, and, and has a zigzag and, and it needs really like a counterpoint. You have one and then the other and one and the other. And they are actually, um, Fuga, this, this fugue in, in six, six voices is, is made on, on silk. Beautiful. Some of the public pieces involving water, it seems to me that they they operate according to obviously a system. And I wondered how much of that mm. was like a score, like almost like a musical score and how much it was randomised or how does it operate? Well, it operates not being a musician. <laughs> it operates very, very close to my feeling in the sense that I improvise quite a lot and I, but listening of course so it's, it's based on the sound and the time so if I something runs for a while and runs too loud and I want it to go down or to sell all of a sudden to to come abruptly you know and it's it has uh, I mean it's a mechanism that is close to a musician but but much more brutal. I mean, it's really, it's really, I mean, I, I, I cannot say that it's music. It is, but it is sound, certainly, and time, which are two things that, of course, one musician has to, but the score is not, it is written, but in minutes, you know, and now, and, but it is based also on how much, in, in perception and observation, how much a person, a human being, can wait for something to repeat or to happen again or to to wait 
until something happens because maybe suddenly it's empty, you know, and you see. So I measure those timings and and, and also sometimes change them. <laughs> Um, is there a particular discipline in your daily working life that you see as an essential ritual? I think running in the morning and walking, that is a discipline that I try to have all the time to do because it really helps me in many ways. It helps me to organise my mind a bit or more than organise because I'm quite disorganised in my mind and my memory. <laughs> but... Uh, it makes me think, it helps me think, uh, thinking in my projects and my work or even in abstract ideas that come and I feel free and, and yeah, I suppose it's the oxygen. If you could live with one work of art, what would it be? You know, instead of with one work of art, I would live inside the Alhambra. That's a very nice idea. <laughs> <laughs> it is a total work of art, so you probably uh, get away a with total. it. It's <laughs> a total. I wouldn't get bored of looking at it and being it, it, choosing different corners where the sound is different and the water runs different. <laughs> Well, I suppose that's the thing, is that it's so, it, there's so much correspondence between your work and the history of Muslim architecture in, yes. in Spain, isn't there? I mean, you know, the use of light, the use of water as materials, it's so yes. crucial to your work yeah. too. Yeah, I think it's very much into our culture too, you know, because, yeah, I mean, that's why... Well, but I say that as I could tell you also the places, but it's true, it's true that it has... Uh, uh, it has affected my work or, or, I mean, the use of screens. And though many cultures have that, that use of, of screens to, to hide or to reveal only part or to see from inside to the outside and other way around, and etc. And also because of the sun to get shadow. And so, but yes, and the water was so important. No, the, the Arab culture has, I mean, did a lot in, the, in Spain to build up our culture we have today i wonder when you made tres aguas were you conscious obviously it's in toledo which is such a was such a crucible for sort of cross-pollination of cultures and you did those three projects involving water there were they in, was that in your mind that history of architectural cross-pollination of course i mean it was not only in my mind that i wanted it to be evident you know i wanted to the idea of getting lost in a place like that between one site and the other Apart from the memory of the piece itself, you would get you can get into Arab baths or or, or Jewish, but that they share water for for two centuries. You know, what they call the term of the convivencia, the that they were living together uh, more or less happily and with problems always, I suppose. But I, I thought, well, because of the city has this. Again, geological stratification, because it's a mountain that, that has a river that surrounds it completely, but only in one part that has the walls. Apart from that, it's, it's full of culture. I mean, it's, it's really, yes, you, you, you know, I mean, you can see so many things. And I thought that memory also to include it in a piece today was important. And lastly, what's art for? I think art opens the door of your imagination to new fields of perception and takes you to other worlds. And that means everything because then you are open to, to listen to others, to, to, to accept yourself and, and be open to, to new worlds, as I said. So I think that's art. Christina, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ben. Ondalea is on the island of Santa Clara near San Sebastian and is now open. You can get there by boat, which will operate until the 30th of September from the port of San Sebastian. An exhibition also called Ondalea is at the Museo San Telmo in San Sebastian until the 26th of September. An exhibition of works on paper, Cristina Iglesias, Una Trayectoria, is at the Real Academia de Bellas Artes de San Fernando in Madrid until the 25th of July. Two major works by Cristina, one of the Celosia works and a vegetation room, are on ongoing display in the Sculpture Park at the Sainsbury Centre in Norwich, UK. 
And a new book, Liquid Sculpture, The Public Art of Christina Iglesias, published by Hatcher Kants, is out now and priced €48. Euros. And that's it for this episode. Please subscribe to A Brush With wherever you're listening and do give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. And do also subscribe to our other podcast, The Week in Art, a deep dive into the latest big art world stories, the top shows and the key issues every Friday. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. Production, editing and sound design on A Brush With are by David Clack and the producers of the art newspaper podcasts are Julie Mihalska and Amy Dawson. Thanks to Henrietta Bentel, Daniela Hathaway and Kabir Jalla. Huge thanks to Christina Iglesias. Join us on Friday for the Week in Art and we'll be back with the next episode of A Brush With next Wednesday. Bye for now. This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Download Bloomberg Connects today and discover cultural institutions on demand.